Yeah, hi everyone and welcome back. I hope you had a very nice first week. So just to briefly recap uh, what happened. So uh, we covered lecture one, the introduction to machine learning. And in the office hours, the most common question was basically about the project, the class project. I will make a separate announcement about that. But uh, yeah, one thing I can already tell you is that I enabled a function on Piazza that you can uh, use to find team members. But I will again share that in a separate announcement. So today in lecture two, we will mainly talk about the k-nearest neighbor algorithm. It's uh, kind of a classic machine learning algorithm, but it's still very useful. And I would say that is uh, maybe the nicest, most gentle introduction to machine learning in, in terms of using the first machine learning algorithm and taking a closer look at how machine learning algorithms work. So also, while it is maybe not the most popular algorithm anymore, I would say uh, I would really still recommend it highly to include it in your projects. So if you work on a project where you want to classify certain things or even let's say uh, predict continuous outputs, I would always start with k nearest neighbors as a, a performance benchmark. So that could be a benchmark in terms of prediction accuracy, but also a benchmark um, in terms of computational efficiency. So speaking of which, uh, along with introducing how k nearest neighbor works, we will also briefly talk a little bit about um, big O, the big O notation, which is um, yeah, a very common way of looking at the efficiency of different algorithms. It's kind of very uh, computer science-y, but still I think it's useful in this context to talk a little bit about big O notation and analyzing algorithm efficiency. That's something I think that is also useful not only for machine learning, but yeah, like uh, programming in general. Yeah, and um, at the end of this lecture then, uh, since I also mentioned computational aspects, after introducing the concepts of K and N, I will also then show you some examples in Python, how we can yeah, use K and N in Python. Of course, this is just a very brief overview. Some parts may be confusing, but again, in the next lecture, in lecture three, I will talk more about Python, how to install it, and also about uh, the main libraries we will be using, like NumPy and scikit-learn. Okay, so then let's get started. So in lecture two, we are going to talk about nearest neighbor methods. This includes aspects about nearest neighbor methods in general, but also more specifically the k nearest neighbor algorithms. For example, k nearest neighbors for classification or regression. To make this lecture a little bit more approachable, I structured it into six parts. So first, we will take a look at some applications of nearest neighbor methods and also just a basic one nearest neighbor method. Then I will show you the decision boundary of the nearest neighbor method to get a better understanding of how it works. After we talked about the nearest neighbor method in general, I will introduce the k nearest neighbor methods, for example, k nearest neighbor classifiers. And after, I mean, this is a very simple concept. After we went over this, we will dive into a more like computer science aspect of this lecture and look at the big O uh, runtime complexity of k nearest neighbor algorithms. It's like a computer science topic that deals with analyzing of uh, uh, analyzing how efficient an algorithm is. After part four, I will show you then some ideas and tricks to improve k nearest neighbor algorithms. So this whole part one to five is rather conceptual. It kind of, uh, kind of introduces the idea behind k nearest neighbors. And after we finished these parts, in the end, I will also show you how you can use k nearest neighbors in Python. So that is also maybe for some of you the most fun part. But of course, first concepts and then the application, because otherwise um, showing you the application first, it would be kind of like some magic stuff going on. So first let's talk about the concepts and then about the application. Yeah, but in a certain way, applications can also be quite motivating for introducing a certain topic. So I picked some example applications of k-nearest neighbor methods in practice. So here I found a research article entitled Automated Web Usage Data Mining and Recommendation System Using the k nearest neighbor classification method. So here the researchers deal 
with web usage data mining. And more specifically, this would be a case of a recommender system. So KNRS Neighbors is still very commonly used for building recommender systems. And here, what they say is basically they trained the K nearest neighbor classifier to be used online and in real time to identify clients or visitor clickstream data, matching it to a particular user group and recommend a tailored browsing option that meet the need of a specific user at a particular time. So it's, um, you can think of it yeah, as a recommendation system, recommend, recommending certain, I would say, I don't know, links or websites and so forth based on the past or present browsing behavior. Yeah, traditionally, k-nearest neighbor methods have also been used extensively in the field of biometrics. That includes like um, face recognition or fingerprint analysis and so forth. Um, nowadays, it's maybe more common to do biometric research using deep learning, but uh, k-nearest neighbor algorithms are still very commonly used in established algorithms that are employed in industry. So here's a little bit of an older paper um, demonstrating the use of nearest neighbor classification for image data. So here um, this is just an example of face image data set and here's the MNIST data set. More specifically, this paper was not um, just about the application of k-nearest neighbors. It was about um, distance metric learning, so learning a distance metric for the k-nearest neighbor method. We will talk more about distance metrics also in this lecture, only very briefly. For instance, um, the Mahalanobis distance uh, was yeah, learned here. We will also briefly mention uh, the Mahalanobis distance and how it's related to the Euclidean distance measure. Um, maybe notable is that they achieved a test error rate of 1.3% on MNIST handwritten digits. So it's just uh, yeah, interesting because we talked about MNIST in the past, in the last lecture. MNIST is a relatively classic image uh, yeah, classification data set where the task was to recognize handwritten digits. I think that was like 50,000 training data points in this data set. So here is another interesting application of k-nearest neighbors. So here it's not k-nearest neighbor classification, but k-nearest neighbor regression. The title of this paper was Remaining Useful Life Estimation of Lithium Ion Cells Based on K-Nearest Neighbor Regression with Differential Evolution Optimization. So here they estimated how many life cycles are left in a yeah, lithium ion battery using K-Nearest Neighbor Regression. Yeah, lastly, one of my applications of K-Nearest Neighbors in a recent um, research collaboration earlier this year so this paper was entitled Machine Learning to Identify Flexibility Signatures of Class A GPCR Inhibition. GPCR, these are proteins, um, so a special type of membrane protein. It's called, um, or this, it's a G protein coupled receptor, sits in the membrane. It's a relatively important receptor throughout yeah, the animal kingdom and of course in humans. It's one of the most or biggest drug targets in humans. It's involved in many, many different processes in the body. So in any case, so here we basically used um, k-nearest neighbors together with feature selection to pinpoint um, certain regions in the protein that are involved in certain activity or in, in active and inactive states of that protein because they're usually some small ligands, small molecules binding to that protein and they can either yeah, activate or inhibit the protein receptor. So we try to learn what distinguishes basically active and inactive proteins. So the inactive and active states. And um, basically also looking at the flexibility transitions that are triggered by biologically active ligands. So here we also used k-nearest neighbor classifiers. Yeah, after such a top-down look at the k-nearest neighbor method. Let us now take a bottom-up approach and talk about the one-nearest neighbor method before we dive more into k-nearest neighbors and how it works. So the one-nearest neighbor method is a very simple method. It's a special case of k-nearest neighbors. So it's um, k-nearest neighbors with 
k equals 1. It's just a special case of k nearest neighbors. So how does the k nearest neighbor method work? Let's say if we want to use it for making predictions. So here I'm showing you a simple data set, a toy data set consisting of two features. So we have a feature x1 and a feature x2. And the training data set consists of five data points. One, two, three, four, five. So given this data set of these blue dots, now assume we have a new data point. We have this data point, this question mark, and we want to predict a target value for this question mark. So how do we do that? So to make this a little bit more concrete, um, for the target value for now, think of it as a classification problem. So we have two classes, class 0 and class 1. Um, so I took the five data points here I showed you in the previous slide and just marked them with appropriate class label. So the triangles here are class 1 and the squares are class 0. So what would be the class label for the question mark point. In the one nearest neighbor method, as the name suggests, we, found, we find the most similar data point to our query point here in the training set. So for the question mark point, this is a new data point. This is, you can think of it as new data point or a new example that we want to classify. So what is its label? We want, want to find want to find the label, which is either the triangle or the square class class zero or class one. And in order to do that, we look at the most similar data point in the training set, and then look at what the label of this training data set point is. So in this case the most similar data point using a Euclidean distance measure would be this point here, the square. So it's the closest point to the question mark. So what we would do now is we predict that this question mark belongs to class 0. And that is how the nearest neighbor or the first simple case of a nearest neighbor method works. It's k nearest neighbor with k equals 1. So we find the one closest data point. So to talk about the nearest neighbor method in a more, I would say, structured way, let's break it down into a training and a prediction step. So remember from lecture one, we usually have a training and a prediction phase. We sometimes also call the prediction phase inference. So how um, does the training step for k nearest neighbors or the one nearest neighbor method looks like? So the nearest neighbor methods are also called lazy oops lazy or lazy learners we often say a nearest neighbor classifier is a lazy learner because there's not really a big training step here the training step is simply remembering or memorizing the training data set so if we have a training data set d here and with the data points um, with a the data points here where x is the feature vector and y is the the label or target value so these are the features so it's a feature vector could be one or more features in the previous slide where we had oops uh, where we had this setup we had two features um and i is the index over the data points in the training set. So in this case, we have i equals 1 to n. We have up to n data points in the training set. And the training step is simply remembering these data points. There's not really much we have to do here in, in the training. It's just storing, storing the data in a sense. Then in the prediction step, there are a few more steps. So the prediction phase of the k nearest neighbor or nearest neighbor methods is a little bit more involved. So that's where nearest neighbor does all its work in a sense. So again, given the training data set of size n, the task in prediction is to predict the label of a new data point. Let's call this new data point xq. 
So we have the features X. Q, you can think of Q stands just for query data point. It's just a new data point. We want to find its label. So we want to know what its um, Y label is, the pre predicted Y label. So we use then the nearest neighbor model, F, to make the prediction on, this, uh, on these features. And the algorithm is as follows. So we start by setting it up with the closest point. So we want to find the nearest neighbor. So in the beginning, we don't have a closest point because yeah, we, we just started it's our initial condition. And then we set an additional um, parameter here, a closest distance. So that would be the distance to the closest point or the distance corresponding to this closest point here. And we set this to infinity here. And then for every uh, data point in the training set, so we are iterating from of we're iterating from one over uh, to n. So we have again n data points in the training set. What we do is we compute the current distance. The current distance means here uh, the distance d, some arbitrary distance measure we can choose. The distance uh, d between the current training set point. So this is a training set point. And this one here, oh, I've written this over here, is the query point. So we compute the distance between each training data point and the query data point. Query data point is uh, the one where for which we want to get the class label or target value. And given this distance, now after we computed this, we check it or we compare it to the closest distance. So in the first round, because we start out with infinity, the first point we will encounter will be the closest point. But then, of course, while we iterate, we may find another more closer point. So if the current distance, if we find that the distance of the current point we are currently looking at is smaller than the closest distance we found previously, we update this variable closest distance with the current distance. And then also we save the closest point. So the closest point is the one that corresponds to this closest distance. So it's this closest point um, that we used in this distance computation. Yeah, and then we return the closest point. So the prediction, so this is uh, the algorithm for finding the closest point, And the prediction would be uh, returning the class label corresponding to this closest point. Because um, let's say I find that the closest point here is the point 13 in my data set. So it would be, let's say, my, my uh, closest point would be 13. But we are, of course, uh, interested in, in the label. So what we would do is we would also have to look up the label of the closest point. And this is the prediction. This is the F closest point, the label corresponding to the closest point. And we have the label because this data point is, of course, the data point 13 is in the training set. Yeah, and that is essentially the main idea behind the one nearest neighbor method. That's the prediction step. So regarding the distance measure, uh, in the previous slide, I just showed you an arbitrary distance measure that I called D. Commonly or most frequently, what people use is the Euclidean distance. So if you have continuous features, you don't have any particular preference. People usually start out using a Euclidean distance measure, but there are many, many other different choices. I will list some of these choices later. Um, but yeah, one, one aspect to mention here is if you use the Euclidean measure, it's kind of important to make sure that the features are all on a comparable scale, that um, each feature uh, weighs in equally because if you scale one feature more than the other then this feature will of course um, dominate the distance computation so if I have two features like x1 and x2 and let's say I um, put a point here in the center and this feature goes from I don't know, 1 to 10 and this feature goes from 1 to 100 of course, uh, if I have a data point, I want to compare it. If I compare uh, 
these two data points to each other. So if I make the comparison between these data points, then um, feature X2 will be much more important than feature X1 because you can see the axis here for X2, this axis is much larger. The values are much, much larger, so they will dominate in this distance computation. So if you want to make a fair comparison, then of course uh, it's important to have the features on the same scale. But um, not, it's not always also a requirement to have the features on the same scale. There may be a reason why you want to weigh a feature more heavily. And in this case, you can also intentionally scale a certain feature. But of course, we will talk briefly about this later. This is a hyperparameter. It's like a decision you can make, but you don't have to make. Okay, but before I get too distracted by already talking about hyperparameters here, let me uh, wrap up this first video. And in the uh, next video, we will take a closer look at the nearest neighbor decision boundary.